We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. One of the greatest barriers to living meaningfully is what I call living in the future rather than today. For example, when I've lost that weight, I will do dot, dot, dot. Or when I've achieved this level of success, or, and this is our topic today, when I'm no longer single, I will fill in the blank. My witness today is Shaney Silver, who is the host of A Single Serving Podcast and author of a new book, A Single Revolution. Don't look for a match, light one. She leads a community which fights against single shaming and helps singles feel comfortable in their own skin. She raises all sorts of interesting questions. Does our society put too much pressure on us to partner up? What impact does that have on single people? Does it keep people in relationships that they would probably be better to leave? How does a meaningful single life look like? Welcome, Shaney. Your book starts with this message. You're not wrong. Being single is not wrong. It's important for single women to hear that. Why do you start the book in that way? It's really at the core of so much single shaming, so many narratives, the basic concept that you have to understand if you're going to move forward in reframing singlehood for yourself is that what you are is allowed. What you are is not a wrong way to exist. And all we've ever heard, most likely, is that it is wrong, that it is a a negative state of existence by default and therefore requires repair via dating and finding someone. It's the assumption that singles, by the nature of being single, are operating in life at a deficit. And that isn't true at all. There is nothing inherently wrong with being single. It is a perfectly valid way to exist. And I started the book that way because, first of all, I wanted to to shake the reader awake and let them know who they were talking (laughs) to. But I, um, I need to challenge that right away because so much else so, so many pieces of advice, so many narratives, so many stories they have at their core being single is wrong. So that's the first thing we need to dismantle if we're going to work on the rest. And if you start off from the premise that there's something wrong with you, you're going to be starting off on the back foot almost, rather than actually, here I am, I'm wonderful, come and get me sort of kind of thing. It's sort of let me try and disguise all my problems. Absolutely. And also if you're, if you're coming at life at a presumed deficit of singlehood, you're thinking that a relationship is going to bring you up to whole. But you're, you're already whole. A relationship is simply going to add to an already whole and valid life. And I think those are the relationships that are probably better for us in the long run. So, you know, we, we're not incomplete. We're not waiting for something to fix us. We are whole and valid right now. And anything else that comes into our life gets to be something on top of that validity, not something that gives us validity. It's a very important distinction to understand. And you're going to live today, not at some point in the future when you're in a couple. Absolutely. Yes, there is no point in putting one's life on hold until uh, you find partnership. But I think quite a lot of people do that. Did you do it yourself? Of course. Of course I did. I'm a single woman. I was born in 1982. All I was ever fed were messages of how wrong and um, bad. And I mean, think of every Disney narrative that had a single woman in it. She was always older. She was always undesirable, undesired. I mean, my favorite, one of my favorite examples is in Lady and the Tramp, which was my favorite movie as a little girl. The aunt with two cats who came to take care of the baby so that the parents could go on vacation. First of all, she's a godsend. She's taking care of a baby so that the parents can leave the house. And she's painted as this terrible being. And two cats? Tell me what's wrong with that. That sounds like a great time to me. So I just didn't really like the way we were portrayed, but it's all I've ever known. At least she's not a witch like sort of Cruella de Vil, who is single and nasty. Yes. Yes. That's, I mean, Cruella is a great example. And I really like the um, more modern makeover we got and a window into her backstory because I think that's important for kids to see too. But in general, the 
entire library of messages that we've received about single women have always been negative. And I love that generations that are growing up now, certainly generations that are being born now, are going to have access to far more narratives around singlehood than we had. But just because that discussion is improving, that doesn't erase our upbringing. We still grew up a certain way. We still have programming and narratives in us. And we're allowed to challenge that. And sometimes challenging that is very, very hard. It can also be a very lengthy process and patience is absolutely required. But we need to understand the messages we've received and the lessons we've learned from that. And we get to evaluate if those lessons have served us. And if they haven't, we get to change them. And it, actually, it's not just single women. I think that I work with men sometimes who are having trouble finding relationships or keeping relationships, and they also feel shamed and that there's something wrong with them and that they are a dirty old man. That's the stereotype rather than Cruella de Vil. It's sort of a, a dirty raincoat and standing behind park benches sort of kind of thing. And actually, a lot of gay men also feel shamed by being single as well. So it's quite a big set of people. Do you think that um, this idea of wrong to be single also keeps people in relationships when maybe it'd be better for them to have some time being single and to recover and learn who they are and effectively dust themselves off and start all over again? Of course. Relationships are a lot of things. And one of the things that they are sometimes is armour that shields you against the shaming messages that single people get that you see single people receive. You see the way that the world treats single people. Um, and you can observe that when you're in a relationship from a place of great comfort and safety. And of course, I, I can't blame anyone for thinking, oh, it's probably better to stay in this relationship than be single because that looks terrible. I would like to make it look wonderful so that people have far more confidence to leave relationships that are not right for them because we get one life. And I can't imagine that spending it bound to a person you don't want to be bound to is genuinely the way that people want to move through life. I have to believe that we're capable of being a lot kinder to ourselves than that. And um, I view staying in relationships that that you maybe shouldn't be in because you're afraid to be single. That's, um, it's like strong language, but I see that as a great cruelty that you do to yourself because you're denying yourself future happiness and you're living in fear essentially. And I get why people do it. I absolutely do. But I just like presenting the idea that there's a different way to live. So reading your book, I have to put my hand up and, you know, I have done a little bit of single shaming myself unwittingly. So those sort of conversations about how's dating going go on any good dates lately, that sort of source of sort of a lunch chit chat with a, a friend isn't just a neutral sort of conversation to have over lunch. Perhaps you can explain why that probably wasn't a good idea to have that kind of conversation with a friend. I think there is more pain hiding in small talk than we've ever really discussed widely before. Uh, the default conversations that we go to when we're hanging out with someone who's single, they're very comfortable, right? They're very uh, safe topics to start on because you've seen that happen so often among family, among friends, even in movies. When, when people sit down to brunch, what's the topic, you know? Well, if you watch Sex and the City, all they talk about is dating, isn't it? Yes. And I mean, that's a huge example of why I think we need to tell more stories, different stories, current stories about sex, about dating, about every perspective that's available within the dating space because Sex and the City is over 20 years old. And at the time, it was really necessary to speak about how single women were really experiencing life and moving through it. And it was an absolutely groundbreaking moment when it came about. But I think after that, we stopped pushing that envelope and we just sort of let Sex and the City bear the weight of telling that narrative. And we never, we never continued the story. We just kept telling the same one. But the experience of singlehood has changed wildly since Carrie and her friends were single and in their 30s because I'm single and in my 30s and I do not relate to what they were uh, doing when that show was on the air. So what is being single in your 30s like then? Fill us in because I have it's a, I have to admit it's a very long time since I was 30. I was single in my 20s, but I've sort of been in relationships for 30 years. So it's a foreign land for me. So please help me. 
Well, I can tell you this. So my perspective is a heterosexual one, so I can only speak to what I've experienced. Um, but my, my audience includes absolutely everybody. So I'm, I'm privileged that I get to hear so many stories that are from different perspectives than mine. But what I know to be true is that it's hard. It is so hard and punishing and at times cruel and unfair. And that's on a good day because I haven't even said the word dangerous yet. So uh. the, the frivolity of being single, the, you know, casual dating and casual sex, and isn't this all just so much fun? That's really insulting to see that portrayed as a story. To me, that leaves out the lion's share because dating horror stories are no longer the exception. Dating success stories are the exception and dating horror stories are the norm and the rule. And I don't like those horror stories being told as entertaining brunch stories, because those are painful and traumatic to endure. So why would I want to retell them for someone else's entertainment? Dating now, the the current dating age is extremely difficult. And I think that is a result of what we've allowed to breed within dating apps. Um, dating in real life has, has always been difficult. And, you know, the surge of people staring into phones all day and all night hasn't made dating in real life any easier either because we all have a social crutch in front of our face. But dating online has, you know, when it started, when it launched, it was a toy that didn't come with instructions. And we have no real idea of what it does to people over time. And I can tell you that in using it for 10 years, we need to look into that because in my opinion, every dating app should come with a therapist and it doesn't. I, the time when I was uh, dating was long before dating apps, but what you used to have would be singles bars. And the th great thing about single type bars is they have a closing time. And so there was sort of make your mind up moment, so to speak. <laughs> I and, love you that. Know, there's something really rather good about make your mind up moments because, you know, you're either going to go home or you're going to start talking to somebody. And, you know, that, a little bit of pressure sometimes just to get a conversation going is good. But dating apps, the, the single bar is never closed. And whereas there's a finite number of people in the single bar, it's an infinite number of people and on the internet. So you're going to treat people worse because, you know, there's always somebody else. Whereas in a single bar, there's probably only 30 odd people there. So you have to be nice to them and you might see them next week and they might tell somebody else what you're like. You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. There were consequences involved. With dating in real life, there were consequences involved. You had to face to face speak and communicate and, and answer for your actions. I have a fantasy wherein I open up a venue, probably something relating to a bar or a club, but it's completely 1990s themed inside. And your admission is your phone. It gets locked up and you have no access to it for the duration of your stay in my club. If I ever see you with the phone, you can never come back again. I want to remind people how to exist in the world without that social crutch and without that safety barrier. Remember what it's like to have butterflies before you say hello to someone for the first time. Remember how that feels. Remember that when it doesn't go well, the world does not end. And you really don't have that much to fear, particularly if you're communicating in a respectful way. It's all going to be okay afterward. But, but dating apps have taken away the need for respect. They have taken away consequences. You know, it's a petri dish of horrible behavior, horrible behavior, the absence of manners. And certainly people do connect and meet on dating apps. There are countless people that we know of that, that have relationships that started on the dating apps. But I think of them as more of an algorithmic anomaly because if dating apps really did work, they would have a constantly dwindling user base because people will be partnering up all the time and deleting them. But instead, we just have hundreds upon thousands upon millions of people using these things and pumping money into them. And dating apps are really one of the only businesses on earth that are not incentivized to actually work. The closest model I can think of to a dating app is gambling. Truly, it's just um, the more a well, dating app a, works, the less money it makes. It is a bit of a gamble, makes. isn't it? Yes, Yes. When you meet someone, the dating app stops making your money. And why would it ever want that? Why would it ever want to work for you? It wouldn't. Those that are, that are single and using dating apps for relationship purposes, they have many, many odds stacked against them. And it has allowed for a culture to develop that I find to be very toxic and um, 
of great concern. I left that culture three years ago because I have no desire to participate. You proudly describe yourself as three years dating app free. Yes. In fact, what's the date today? We're almost we're almost at exactly three years, actually. <laughs> All right. So let's have a quick hip hip hooray. Yes. Happy, happy oh, third God. birthday. They've been so lovely. You know, global pandemic notwithstanding, they've been a wonderful three years. So does your whole attitude sort of change? Is it a bit like sort of kicking cigarettes or alcohol that your sort of fingers want to go to them for a while? I think that's a really elegant way to connect those things because yes, there are absolutely addictive behaviors associated with dating apps. And remember that they were designed to cause those. So feeling bad that you feel compelled to re-download a dating app, don't feel bad. That was exactly its intention. You're doing what it wanted you to do. So self-forgiveness and self-kindness is really necessary when you delete dating apps. But the difference for me, the reason that I deleted them and never even felt compelled to download them again was that I finally asked myself, what are they giving me? How are they serving me? What are they adding to my life? And that answer was nothing or even worse, only bad things. And I was choosing to allow all of this badness to flow into my life voluntarily. And as soon as I sort of understood that, understood the reality of the situation, what was actually happening to me, it was very, very easy to permanently delete them and never even feel drawn to re-download. And it's a tough habit to break. And anyone who does it should feel very proud of themselves. Uh, but I, I can absolutely assure you that a life without dating apps is wonderful. So. How did you sort of step off the merry-go-round, so to speak, that actually instead of thinking, you know, I'm going to turn into Cruella de Vil, if I don't find a partner, I'm going to be old and I'm going to have, when I die, the cats are going to eat my eyeballs out, into I'm single and that's fine. Well, first of all, if I die and my cats are still there, what I would like is that my friends will come and take care of them because they will be provided for in my will, obviously. But the the real way that I stopped um, feeling compelled to date via dating apps or even I stopped feeling compelled to put active effort into finding a partner because I remembered that there are an infinite number of ways that people meet. You don't know two couples that met in the exact same way, that came together in the exact same way, that connected in the exact same way. That will always be as unique to that relationship as a fingerprint. It's very, very unique. And I find beauty in that. I find possibility in that. I know that singles often tend to feel a bit jealous when we hear stories of how people met, but I need to hear them and I need other singles to hear them too. Because when you reframe that lens from one of jealousy to one of possibility, you're reminded that so many options out there exist for how people can connect. And it's dating apps are limiting. They limit our focus. They narrow down our field of vision down to something the size of a pinhole. And we forget that the entire world is available to us. And honestly, if I actively tried to date and actively tried to find someone for a full decade, and it didn't happen one time, I don't think active effort is, is the thing for me. I think I'm just allowed to live and, um, and connect with the relationships that are right for me in the future. And the, the relinquishing of the wrongness of singlehood, understanding that I'm not wrong for being single, allows me to relax and settle into that um, sort of just live your life strategy. And it allows me to trust that the right relationships will find me when they're meant to. So how did you break out of wrongness? Was there a light bulb moment or a series of light bulb moments? I think it was two things. I think it was a series of light bulb moments for sure, but I also think it was exhaustion. I think it was absolute exhaustion. I was spent after 10 years of fruitless trying, 10 years of an incredible amount of shame on top of that trying, because remember, while I'm trying to not be single, the world is telling me, hey, don't be single anymore. And I'm stuck in the middle saying, are you kidding? I'm trying. I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying and no one cares. No one cares. No one can fix it. No one can help because all dating advice is nonsense. And that's a whole other podcast episode. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, it was just exhaustion. I was so, I was so tired and I had to believe that I was put on earth for more than that. 
I do believe that I was put on earth for more than that. I was put here to do so much more than search for someone else. And that's sort of quite a spiritual sort of kind of thought in two levels of one, you know, I have a purpose for my life. And secondly, um, I'm just going to use the word the universe, but that the universe might actually send somebody in your direction rather than you having to go effectively looking under every stone. I believe that's exactly what's going to happen because every relationship I've ever had until now has happened that way too. So, And it's quite a difficult journey to actually accept this extra dimension because we live in a very sort of practical download this app sort of kind of world, you know, pull this lever here and uh, over there, this is going to happen. So that's really quite a big thing to do. And then to trust that the universe will provide, that's also a very big thing to do. So tell me some of these light bulb moments so we can sort of see the shifts going on inside of you. Oh, there's so many. I mean, one of the earliest ones, I was still in my 20s and I went on a vacation with four people. They were two couples. And when we got to the house that we had rented, it was just understood that because I was the single person, I was going to take the room with the two bunk beds, the two very small children's bunk beds. And I laid there in that bed and I remember so clearly staring up at that, you know, the bed up above me and just thinking, why why is this the assumption? Why do I have to get the worst sleeping situation just because I'm one person? There are two beds in here. A couple could sleep here too, but we would never ask that of someone married because someone married is considered fully adult and fully finished and valid and whole. And I'm not. And that was the first time I knew that I was going to start challenging what that meant. And then a few years later, I remember being home for uh, Thanksgiving, celebrating Thanksgiving with my family. And I was running errands with my parents. And I was in my early 30s and I was sitting in the back seat of my mother's car, just stuffed between like groceries and dry cleaning and you name it. And honestly, this, this thought popped into my head in such a way that like I felt like I didn't put it there. Like it just sort of arrived and it was, you don't have to find someone before your life can start. Your life can start now. I used to describe it as feeling like I was chained to a starting line and all of my friends were just running laps around me and I couldn't start running until I had a partner. And I just finally acknowledged that I can like unlock that, that chain that's keeping me on the starting line myself. I don't need someone else to feel real for my life to feel real. And that was a big part of how I started shedding shame and moving forward in a way that started challenging narratives, but I didn't really start writing about them or podcasting about them until a couple of years later. Um, my podcast is three years old. My my writing in this space is about four years old. So um, there was a lot of that, there was a lot of that time that was spent in a in a prior version of me. And um, I think I think the universe gifted me with a with a future in that way because um, I really, really believe that I, I'm here for so much more than how I was spending my life. And I'm very grateful for that sort of slow awakening, I guess. And what about your mother? Has she been supportive on this journey? Or I'm suspecting there have been times when she's been less than supportive. Actually, I'm, I'm in a rather unique position. My mother is, is incredibly supportive of me in terms of dating and partnering. So I was raised by a single mother with two children and she's been married multiple times and she's never looked at me with any sort of urgency around getting married at all. I wasn't allowed to date under her roof. I was not allowed to date at all while I lived with my mother. And um, by the time I got to college, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing or know how to date because I had no experience in it. Uh, so it was just sort of learning as I went as a little bit of a late bloomer compared to those around me. Uh, but she's never she's never said, when are you getting married? Why aren't you dating anybody? When are you having kids? She's actually the most supportive person in my life in terms of my child-free choice. So it's unique in that way. I mean, we have plenty of other things that we disagree on. But um, <laughs> in terms of, of dating and relationships, she's been one of my greatest supporters. And certainly since she's seen me create the work that I do, there's no nagging in that space. There's none. So what would you say for people who get into the position where people say things like, Shaney, you're such a beautiful woman. You're so full of life. You've got everything going for you. How can you possibly be single? I would throw that back in their direction. Well, why haven't you introduced me to my husband? You know, why is it always the individual's responsibility to solve this problem? Why is there no community aspect to this? 
that's starting to irritate me more and more these days is that we think everybody should be with somebody, but yet we don't want to help. And that just feels like judgment to me. That feels like shaming. That feels like judgment. Unless you literally have my husband in your back pocket. And if you do, for heaven's sake, take him out. You really can't say much to me about my life because it doesn't affect you. And I know that that the situation like the one you described is often coming from a good place. It is coming from someone who admires you and cares about you and wants the best for you. But where we need change is understanding that singlehood is the best for us too. It is a completely lovely and valid way to live. And I don't like moving through life where every time someone sees me, they see sadness. I don't want to live like that. And I want to be part of changing the narrative so that single women are no longer viewed with sadness behind the eyes because we don't deserve it. This, I'm sorry, this life is too much fun. So tell us about the single life and the fun and the good parts of it then. The good parts are freedom. The good parts are an absence of compromise. I I was thinking about this as I made my bed yesterday because I'd recently bought a bedspread that is printed in tigers and the tiger is a more feminine design, you might say. And I was just thinking how I didn't have to run this by anybody. I didn't have to get anyone's approval on this. I didn't have to, there was no compromise involved. I saw it. I loved it. I bought it. It's there. And I think we forget how valuable those freedoms are, the, the absence of needing someone else's being on board. It's so relaxing. <laughs> it's so relaxing to never have to compromise. And there are bigger ways that there's an absence of compromise for me too. And, and there's so many ways that it's practical, that it's valuable and, and ways that are considered taboo to talk about. I've said before, not recently because it hasn't really come up lately, but that I don't, um, I, I prefer not to date people with children. And I used to get a lot of shame for that. And of course, people who would give dating advice will say, well, then that's why you're single because I've decided since you don't want to date someone with kids, that's the thing that's holding you back from partnership. But what they don't realize is I grew up with a parent who was dating other people with children. And it's not just dating that person. You aren't just dating that person. You are dating a family. And it's really important to remember that that family also comes with someone else who used to be married to that parent. And you're dating that person too. And I want the freedom to live where I want to live, to move where I want to move, to to have ownership over my life. And the binding of ourselves to other people will always come with compromise. And believe me, so many of those compromises are beautiful. They're wonderful and they're beautiful and they're right for some people. They just aren't right for me. And so freedom for me is the most wonderful part of singlehood. And it's also the most educational because it tells you the things you are willing to compromise on and the things you are not. And the things that you're not willing to compromise on, those aren't the things that are keeping you single. Those are the things that are keeping you from being in wrong relationships because the right relationships for you will respect those boundaries and respect those preferences that you have and those needs that you have. So the amount of education that this single time of my life has afforded me is just invaluable. So what else have you learned being single? Oh my gosh, that you can be. I've learned that you can be. There are so many fears and blocks that we are fed, particularly as single women, but I think as single people, things you can't do on your own, things you can't do without someone else. For years and years, I didn't think that I was even allowed to travel by myself. Solo travel wasn't something that I even entertained because isn't that so sad and pathetic? It's not. It's wonderful. I prefer it now. Um, but I mean, even just like the, the micro versions of that, I have people in my community who are taking themselves to dinner alone for the first time as adults in their 30s and 40s. And they're loving it, but they didn't think they could do that before. That seems rather sad, really. It could, but I'm, I'm just proud that they got there. Whenever you get there, I'm proud that you get there. So yeah, that, that's kind of how I look at it. Now, as a therapist, how do you think you walk the path between, you don't want to blame people for being single, but you want to help them if they no longer want to be single and to see if there's something psychologically that's actually blocking them? How does one walk that path? Well, I'm not a therapist, so I couldn't really say. What I can say is that I'm tired of fault-based messaging. I don't like it when someone's singlehood is something that a therapist or a family member or a friend will use some some quality within that single person as the as the blame moment. I don't like fault-based messaging around singlehood in any capacity and I find that 
there are so many narratives out there that that don't serve us. Things like, well, you're single because you don't love yourself or you're single because you have unresolved trauma. I know plenty of people who don't love themselves and do have unresolved trauma who have been happily married for years. So I'm not buying it. I'm just not buying it. As somebody who sees a lot of couples, they might not be quite so happily married, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> but the, you know what, though? I don't need that. I don't need to know how miserable couples are to be happily single. And a lot of people use couplehood misery as sort of a way to bolster their own singlehood happiness. But I think that's illogical. That was not what I was talking about. But just that actually, if you have a lot of unresolved trauma in your life, there's going to be a pit of darkness, for want of a better word. And a lot of people actually, rather than addressing the darkness or the pain, they find coping mechanisms. Now, some of the coping mechanisms might actually involve being in a relationship and that having somebody around to do X, Y, Z and try and bolster up your ego or whatever and make you feel better sort of works on one level. But actually, being in a relationship with somebody that's forever asking you to stroke them and make them feel better is completely and utterly exhausting. And then the person says, why aren't you doing more for me? And you can begin to see how the unresolved trauma is going to cause problems whether you are single or whether you are in a relationship. And it's probably better, this is me as a therapist coming at, because I'm sort of with you 100% on the idea of let's stop single shaming. And your book has been really helpful for me spotting some of it. But I think that if single people want to understand what their trauma and you know, it might not necessarily be the sort of dramatic kind of trauma of, of attacks and whatever. It could be the drip, drip, drip of, of some unhelpful messaging from one or both of your parents. If those are actually holding you back, isn't it better to understand them and to actually begin to address them rather than saying, you know, I don't want to look there? I'll disagree only because I don't think someone's past trauma is preventing them from meeting people in the wild. And your childhood messaging, your programming, and, and we all have, we all have things that we need to look at. 100% of us have things that we need to look at from, from when we were kids. But I don't think any of it is preventing us from meeting human beings. And I think when you get down to it, if there was ever a reason why someone is single, I think there's only one. The only reason I think people are single when they don't want to be is that they just haven't met their partners yet. And I don't see how unresolved trauma or, or anything really is preventing you from physically meeting new people. I don't think it's stopping you from meeting new people, but it's going to have an impact on how the two of you relate and how good a relationship you have. Now, you might actually become a couple but that trauma is going to impact on the you as a couple. It's going to impact on you as a single person. So isn't it better to understand? I mean, this is me speaking one as a therapist and somebody who's um, currently uh, about a year and a half into analysis. It's sort of easier if you understand yourself better to navigate yourself, your way through the world. So, you know, I think understanding yourself isn't the same as actually blaming yourself. Yeah, but I think anyone in the world could benefit from understanding themselves better, single or partnered. I don't think that's exclusive to singles, and I don't think it's something that singles have to do before they can consider themselves ready for partnership, because I know plenty of couples who weren't ready either, but they're still together and they're still happy. So I think everyone, 100% of people, could benefit from inner child work, from therapy, from all sorts of, of processing of, of messages that we've absorbed throughout our lives. Everyone can benefit from that. And I won't agree on any level that that is more necessary when you're single. I think that's exactly the same amount of necessary for, for couples and singles alike. Yeah. And we're not arguing that one. It's just that um, I suppose I wanted to give people permission that um, if they were single and it was causing them pain, that a therapist could be somebody that could actually help rather than somebody who's actually going to end up saying, well, you're single for X, Y, Z reasons. It's a space to explore, to ask yourself questions and to be really listened to. And so, and the reason I was asking that question is because most people in my profession don't really think of the whole concept of single shaming deeply enough. And so, 
you know, what I was hoping is that you would, because I have a lot of um, therapists that listen to this, that, you know, you could actually give us a way of approaching people without actually, to help them understand themselves better without actually shaming them at the same time. I think that's, I think that's where I'm trying to get to. Absolutely. Well, I think that's the perfect way to identify if you're speaking to the right therapist or not. I think if your therapist is single shaming you, you need to speak with someone different. But I think for therapists themselves, just approaching your clients, understanding that their singlehood is not a problem. It is not a flaw. It is not a problem. It is not something that's wrong with them. It is simply a way of existing that is perfectly allowed and perfectly good and right. And making that mental shift, I think, can impact the way that we speak to single people in the first place. Because unfortunately, I've encountered a lot of community members who have spoken to therapists who uh, not only view their singlehood as a problem, but have said really, really degrading and demeaning things during therapy. But again, that's that's an education moment. That's just, you're learning that that is not a therapist that is someone you should be speaking with if they're shaming something about you that isn't wrong. But I think shedding the wrongness is for everyone. Thinking about singlehood as something that is completely on par in rightness with couplehood, I think that's where you start. Because couplehood and singlehood are absolutely equal in validity and rightness. They're, one is not better than the other. One is not worse than the other. They are equal. Couplehood and singlehood are absolutely equal. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So something we're doing new is that everyone is invited to write in and tell us about a dilemma that they're dealing with to get my advice and the advice of one of my witnesses. And this is a letter that's been written in to me by a woman. About nine months ago, I finally admitted to myself that my marriage had broken down beyond repair. Up to that point, I'd been focused on fixing it, even though we were separated. So I find myself in my 50s, single, and I don't like it. I've told myself enough licking your wounds, you have to get back out there. I have done a dating course because I had no idea how it's done today. I've researched what are the best platforms for women in my age group. In fact, I've approached it like a work project. Identify goals, research the market, put together a strategy. So far, I've been on a few dates. I've enjoyed some good conversations, but there's always a problem. For example, he's only passing through my area, he's too pushy, etc. I wonder if I'm doing what I did when I was young, I'm being too picky. But on the other hand, I've found myself forcing myself to go out on a date, so I also wonder if I'm ready to date again. But I must get out there. I can't rely on my almost adult children, much as I love them and they love me, to go on holiday with me, spend special days like New Year, etc. Thank you for that letter. If you'd like to write one yourself, go to my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts, and you'll find right at the very bottom of that page a form that you can send a letter to us on. So, Shaney, what do you think of this letter? Well, first of all, I thank you to this person for writing in a very thoughtful letter. I think my advice there is not going to be of the dating variety. My advice is going to be, I would look at why you are operating from a place of lack in the first place, because it sounds like this person is assuming that they lack a partner and also assuming that being single is not allowed. And when you feel like you are missing something, when you are lacking a partner and that's unacceptable, yeah, you're going to feel pressured to date and you're going to strategize it and treat it like a job. But why? Why are you doing that? Have you asked yourself why you really want a partner? Is it worth going through what this person is currently going through just to have someone to hang out with on New Year's Eve? Have you ever tried New Year's Eve alone? It's actually lovely. I hear so much lack in that letter. I hear so much assumption of lack in that letter. And I think evaluating really why you want a partner, particularly after having spent so much time with one and being faced with this opportunity to experience life in a different way. I see it as a, as a wonderful opportunity to spend some time by yourself and see what that really feels like um, because it doesn't have to feel scary and prohibitive and lacking. 
It gets to feel abundant and full and completely customized to your tastes and no one else's, to your ideas and preferences and things you want to experience and things you want to do. There's just such an opportunity in front of this person and I don't want them to miss it because the worst time to discover how wonderful being single is, is the day you get married. And unfortunately, it's really hard (laughs) to understand how great singlehood is if you've never entertained the idea that it's a good thing. So there's no dating advice that I'll give this person because dating advice is all nonsense. There's no dating advice that anyone can give you. There's no dating advice in the world that can tell you when and where to be in order to meet the right people for you. That's impossible. So instead, what I would look at is where is this urgency messaging really coming from? Where is this lack messaging really coming from? And I think in digging into that, you might be able to release the pressure valve on the compulsion to date. What if you're just feeling really lonely? Lonely is allowed, but lonely is solved in a multitude of ways, not just by a romantic partner. We have over-prioritized a romantic partner. We have put too much pressure on romantic partnerships because there are many, many ways to find company, to find community, to find purpose, and limiting ourselves to thinking we can only find that through a romantic partnership or thinking that romantic partnership is the most valid version of companionship and company. It it devalues everything else. There's just so much out there to experience. And I'm very tired of, I'm very tired of us exalting romantic love and partnership to such heights and such expectations. I find that we could all benefit from just a lot more balance, just balance out that desire across a multitude of relationships. And I think that that can cause or that can promote feelings of ease and comfort and confidence and contentment. I suppose, um, and I'm just sort of sitting here thinking about it, that the temptation of a partnership is that it's sort of a one-stop shop to solve a lot of problems. If you've got a partner, you've got somebody to go to the concert with you, et cetera, et cetera. You haven't actually got to sit there and think, who would go with me to see Barry Manilow sort of kind of thing? You just say, Oi, we're going to see Barry Manilow next week, sort of kind of thing. I'm saying Barry Manilow because one of my women friends once phoned me up. Uh, her husband didn't want to go and see Barry Manilow. And I I actually rather like Barry Manilow. So we went to see Barry Manilow together and had a really good time. But if I hadn't been available, you know, her husband would have gone because she went to see his Yes concerts. Um, <laughs> and so she suffered through Yes. And oh my God, he suffered through it. Barry Manilow. Well, that's what you do for people you love sometimes. Yeah. So it sort of seems like a a quick one-stop shop. And actually, one-stop shops and quick fixes are probably not the right way to go. I wouldn't think so. Also, go to Barry Manilow alone and make new friends because everyone else in the room loves someone you love. You already have something in common. You already have something to talk about. It's ah, Why is there such fear around doing things alone? I promise you that no one's looking at you. No one is looking at you and thinking, oh my God, that's so sad. They're all alone. No one notices. No one notices. You could go to a restaurant tonight. First of all, always sit at the bar. I I recommend that for singles every time. Always do bar seating. It's a much more social place. You can talk to people next to you. You can talk to the bartender. But go, go to dinner alone tonight, safely if you can. And notice how few people care that you're by yourself. <laughs> Notice how few people even notice that you're by yourself. If not, people that are jealous. Like, I wish I could go somewhere alone. I've never had the bravery to do that. How'd you do it? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I had lunch today alone, but I think lunch somehow is an easier thing to to do because, you know, I had I had, you know, a break between clients. Did I want to have a sandwich in my office? No. Did I want to go out? Yes. Did anybody look at me? No. No. And lunch is great training wheels for for dinner alone. Give give lunch a try first. I do the same thing with solo travel. The first time I I traveled alone, I traveled um, domestically and very close to the city that I lived in. It was just a quick uh, train ride away. And then after that, I I developed my skill set there, and I went to Paris next. And now I go to Paris every year when I can travel by myself, and it's my favorite thing ever. And I never have to hear someone say to me, "But we went there last year." Yeah, I did, and I'm going to go there next year too. Like. That that's what's happening. So I would say two things about this letter myself. The first one is when we have, I must do something. I always want to question the idea, I must get out there. And because you're saying, I must get out there now, 
why does it have to be now? You could do it another time. It doesn't have to be now. If you're forcing yourself to do something, it's normally a bit of a clue that something isn't right. And actually, when people say, I wonder if I'm ready to date again, that often is another piece of wisdom that you have to recover enough to actually get back up on the horse again. If you've still got wounds and you've got your, a broken leg and your arm in a sling, you're probably not going to be in a, a good place to go horse riding. So if you're thinking, am I ready to date again? I would say the answer is probably no. And the whole idea of must is another thing to actually do. And if you do continue to date, I wish you good luck. And I think, actually, I suppose I'll throw one more thing in. Don't think that dating is the only place you can actually meet people because, you know, if you're at work, you meet people. If you're on the train, you might meet somebody on the train. Conversations happen all sorts of, in all sorts of different ways. So don't think that it's only going to be through a dating app. So, Shaney, thank you very much for being my witness today on The Meaningful Life. I have to ask you, what makes your life meaningful? Oh, my goodness. Um, what makes my life meaningful? You know what? I'm, I'm a very lucky person. I have found what I love to do, and I'm very lucky that I do it well. And I say that from living a, you know, a decades-long career <laughs> before I found the the purpose and the uh, the passion that I have for what I do now. I think my life is meaningful because I found a way to spend it that I enjoy, that I'm good at, that helps people. I think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world. I've found a way to help people feel better and I enjoy doing that. And that's such a gift. I don't take it lightly because loving your profession, you know how they say, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I used to look at people that achieved that with such jealousy, with such longing and just the assumption that it would never happen for me. But it did because I pushed my own envelopes and I tested the limits of what I thought was possible. And I did it slowly and I did it carefully, but I I got there. And so I feel very lucky and very grateful that I have this career and, and a community that I love. I love them both very, very deeply. And I don't take that lightly at all. I'm someone who's very, very lit up by my work and driven by my work. And so um, to finally love it is the greatest gift. And that makes my life really meaningful. I know many people will say family and friends, and I love my family and friends, but I do spend a lot of time alone. And in that alone time, I'm creating something that I'm watching people benefit from. I can't think of a better way to spend my time than that. Well, if you'd like to hear more from Shaney, we're going to talk three things she knows deep down to be true. You can join us in the bonus material. And if you want to find out how you can hear that bonus material, here comes all the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.